So, thank you for coming this morning. I know it's like the last last morning, and it's we're all kind of a bit workshopped out a little bit. Um, so today's session is very much about the approach that I and the tools and things that I use with my addiction clients. Um, so hopefully you'll kind of take some, you know, some seeds away from it. I'm very much about people making it their own. Yeah, this isn't a rigid step-by-step -step thing. Um, so it's about just helping people with that background insight of the world of addiction. So I work with all forms of addiction, but predominantly today I'll just be kind of talking about drink and drugs, because it's probably the more relatable for people. So, but I also find that this stuff is very transferable. You know, it's not just about addiction clients, it's about you know, anxiety clients. It, it, it's very transferable to other, other people. So, a little bit about me. Good morning. So I was what, you know, I would have called myself a heavy drinker. But in hindsight, I was a functioning alcoholic. And then about age of 30, I found my first drug. Then 2016, age 42, I was on my knees. Um, I'd lost friends, relationships with my family were strained. I'd gone bankrupt. Um, I'd lost my job. I'd lost my house. But I talk about that being as kind of, you know, my blank canvas. I was your stereotypical addict. You know, I was that x-ray that I'd run away from a hospital. Um, so I talk about it as being my blank canvas. That's, you know, I was broken. So it was about rebuilding that life from there on. So I threw myself into rec recovery and just kind of gradually started to re rebuild my life. I had hypnotherapy in the early days and kind of fell in love with it. And here I am. Um, and I kind of say about, you know, I had the unfortunate but fortunate journey so I can help my clients. You know, we all know that kind of, you know, the best people to help people with certain things is if you've lived it. So as we go through, um, I have kind of left time at the end for questions. Um, so, yeah. So, still need my, name, my notes. So my client demographic, I was just speaking to the lady there. Um, my clients are just everyday people. You know, they've got normal lives. They're maybe just finding that the cracks are forming. You know, they're spending, they're being banished to the um, spare room. They're waking up on the sofa a bit more too often. You know, it's causing a bit more arguments in the household. Um, it's not your stereotypical alcoholic or your drug addict. You know, yes, they're there, but everything's a spectrum. So, you know, my clients are pretty much... And at the end of the day, they afford to pay us. You know, we don't do it for free, do we? So for one person, it might be that second bottle of wine is too much. For another person, it might be having, you know, that line on a Monday morning to get over the weekend and get them through the day. Regardless what it is, it's the client's perception and their reality. You know, there's no tick list. There's no kind of, oh, yes, yes, you're an alcoholic. Yeah, it's about the purple's li person's life. They've tried to just stop him, but they've still ended up in the chair. So this is about approaching it in a different way. Okay? I have four questions that I ask them. You know, is this having a negative impact on your life? Mine went blank. Is it having a negative impact on your life? Is it stopping you fulfilling your responsibilities? You know, you're picking kids up from school, you're taking them to, you know, weekend clubs and things. Is it causing you financial distress? You know, it, it, is that money quickly get, getting lost? Are you engaging in life? You know, are you going out with friends? Are you going around to see family? Or are you just, you know, reclused under your duvet? So the approach that I work with is, you know, it's a partnership for me, yeah? I'm no different just because I'm sat in my chair. I get it, you know. And with that, I can be direct. You know, I know the bullshit that we tell ourselves. And it's free from judgment, you know. Some of the stuff I've done in the past, I can't kind of say, yeah, no, you're, you're, you're a bad one. I have three prongs as well, three ways I approach it. So it's about understanding the past, you know, just getting an overview, not going on a hunting expedition. You know, there's no point digging stuff up that we don't need to dig up. 
where they are specifically now, you know, what's made them pick up that phone? You know, there's been something that's made them just do it. And where they want to be. Not where other people tell them they need to be. Where do they want to be? They've been to Dr. Google. They've listened to everybody around them and it's, you need to stop. It's abstinence. But that's not what they want. And as we kind of know as therapists, you know, you can't go against resistance because you don't get anywhere really with it, do you? So I asked them, what do you want? You know, what do you want? And they generally said, you know, I just want to be able to have a few glasses of wine. I just want to be able to go out and, you know, have a meal in a restaurant. For some people, it might be just, you know, I just want an occasional line, you know, if I'm out for my birthday. But it's about self-management and self-control. Because again, if you kind of try and go against yourself, what you truly want, it's hard work, isn't it? But I do believe there's a line. And if you cross that line, there's no coming back from it. But each person's different, okay? It could be that someone's line was them getting kicked out of home. Another person's line that, you know, they become dependent on alcohol, physically dependent. We, ne we hardly ever talk about drinking drugs because actually that's not the problem. You know, it's a symptom. There's something causing it. So my idea of this was people do tend to focus on how much you're drinking and when are you drinking and what time of your day you're drinking. It's not about that. It's about what's triggering you to drink at that time of day. Go on. So I'm just going to go in straight. What pisses me off? Yeah. You hear this within the therapy community. Yeah. So in Facebook groups, I, I've... I've read this stuff and I jump straight on it. So we don't need to get clean because we're not dirty. That phrase, that thing that's thrown around about, you know, sub, you know, clean and sober, it's twaddle. We're not damaged, we're not broken. We're not all liars, criminals, thieves, yes, that's further down the spectrum, you know, when it, it starts causing more problems and everything else. We're not beyond help. I don't actually think I've ever turned a client away. I've actually seen them for at least one session. And most of the time it's that they don't see that hypnotherapy or is, is right for them. We do want help. It's not a case of that we're just saying to people, yeah, I'll get help and you know, there's that, you've probably heard it yourself. They've got to really want it and it's got to come from them. These ones are what I've really heard in the therapy groups. So get payment up front. Don't take um, electrical goods as payment. If they cancel, late, they just don't turn up, they're not committed. So my general reply to that is if you've got an anxiety client that's in the middle of a panic attack and they don't come for an appointment because, you know, they, they, even just picking up the phone, we don't think bad of them. We give them empathy. Oh, I'm really sorry, you know, all that kind of stuff. But... You, you hear people, no, nope, that's it, they're not interested, tarnish them. Um, don't trust anything we say. How many times have you heard from clients, lies, cover-ups, yeah? We are trying. We do see the impact it's having on us and the, the life around us. We do promise ourselves, this is the last time I'm going to do this. So the solution to our problems become the problem. We end up on a roundabout with no exits. But then, so the initial problem, plus the problems that we're creating, equals more problems. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And again, the, the kind of deeper you go and the deeper you go into it. Cool? So, I kind of have six principles, six Ds. So declutter. This tends to be the first session. This isn't in order. This can be multiple principles in multiple sessions so we declutter we just take off the surface stuff we just get rid of that overwhelm and confusion and I use something called the junk room and you can find that on my YouTube channel so we discover you know we unpick and dismantle uh, sorry dismantle what's left again it's not a hunting expedition and very much a thing of what needs to come up will come up Understanding the past is an explanation, it's not an excuse. Oh, I've had such a bad life, I can, you know, it, it justifies me 
drinking or doing drugs or gambling or whatever it is, it's an explanation. And we probably already find with people what they think the problem is, isn't. So I had a client that came to me for gambling addiction and he'd racked up £40,000 worth of debt just by clicking the mouse. In his head, his gambling addiction started four years ago when he finished his um, long-term relationship. But when we followed the coping strategy back, it took him back to being 16. He wanted to work for his dad's business, but his dad wouldn't let him. So he made him go to college. So whenever he skipped class or had free periods, he'd go to the bookies or the amusements. So that's where the coping strategy started. Yes, it got kind of escalated and blew up when he split up with his girlfriend. And there is that, you know, knowledge is power. When he kind of realised that, he was like, oh, right, OK, then. It's not this great big drama event. They decide what they want to keep and what they want to let go of. You know, there's some things that's actually quite helpful, some coping strategies, some beliefs that can be helpful, so it's not about just getting rid of everything. We disconnect the emotions and the feelings um, from the events. You know, that could be parts, that could be timeline, could be in a child. I don't have a protocol, I don't have a structure. It's just what suits the client. Yeah, it's just, sometimes, I'll, I'll be honest, even when a client's closed their eyes, I still don't fully know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah? I don't prepare my sessions because you don't know what the client's going to bring. Yeah? I'm spending hours, ooh, this and that, no. Yeah? Direction. Who do they want to be and where do they want to be? But them. Not what family's telling them, what, not what Google's telling them, what, not all the stuff on YouTube's telling them. But deserve. The, you know, the self-belief, the self, you know, the um, self-worth has been smashed. So it's about building that. There's no one to blame. You know, there's no thing, there's no event, there's no person to blame. Yes, it's had a part, but again, it's that, it's an explanation, it's not an excuse. It is what it is. You know, lots of people have similar experiences in life and they don't turn to drink and drugs. But we can blame everyone. Yeah, but this and them and, you know. No, it's not. A big part of it is accountability and responsibility. We've never taken it. Again, we've always blamed somebody else. And when people have to take accountability and responsibility, they have to take action. It's about... It's not always about what did happen about what didn't happen. So, again, just, did a child not get the attention at home that they should have done? Nothing specific has happened to them. You know, they've had, they've been given everything that they, they need, the love, you know, the, the, the safety, the security, but maybe they didn't get the attention. And that's caused, um, you know, that's created then into going to kind of attention seeking and being that party animal and, yeah? We all have thousands of thoughts every day, but we don't act on them. I'm sure you've all wanted to tell bosses about themselves. Yeah? But you haven't. So it's control. So it's about smashing the idea of, I don't have control. Yeah, you do. Because you don't act on everything during the day. Willpower. Everyone thinks about willpower power being this drive and motivation to make change. But actually, willpower is also you know, to carry on doing something you don't want to do and you know the impact it's going to have and the arguments it's going to have and you, you hang over tomorrow, to carry on doing that is willpower as well. We have willpower in abundance. All of us do. It's just about where it's directed. We're stuck by fear. Fear of, how can I stop? I can't stop. You know, I've tried all this time to try and stop or reduce it or control it, and I can't. So we've got this fear of, can I actually do it? But then, fear on the other side of that, who, who am I? What do I like? What don't I like? You know, that fear of not knowing ourselves, you know, that connection with self. Talk about the um, pain of being stuck versus the discomfort of unsticking. You know, I point out to them, you know, the pain that you brought with you 
will be much, much more of the time and the, the effort it's going to take you to change. Cool. The way forward. So I compassionately challenge. I call them out on the ship. You know, I'm direct. I just say it as it is. I will say the things that other people won't say to them. Because that, you know, I wasn't wrapped in cotton wool. So I don't wrap my clients in cotton wool. I offer them a 24-7 phone support. Again, in my recovery, having that connection to other addicts that get it. You know, you can ring up and say, yeah, I've had a really shit day and I want to go and get a bottle of wine. You know, if you ring your friends, well, don't get it. <laughs> if it were that easy. <laughs> yeah? Just yeah, just, you know, just, yeah. But I have a spiel with that. People kind of have a go at me or kind of say, yeah, but boundaries and don't get me started on that B word anyway. Um, but I have a spiel. So, ringing me at six, so I'm at the end of the phone, night or day for you. Can't always get to it, but I will always get back to you. Ringing me at six o'clock in the evening on the way home and you've had a bad day, it's conversation. Ringing me at 10 o'clock at night, drunk, are you okay, are you safe, speak tomorrow. So I had this client and came in, that's it, I've thrown all the drink out of the apartment and I was like, yeah, let's just see where this goes. So, rang me up one evening, 10 o'clock, drunk, are you okay, are you safe, I'll speak to you tomorrow. Spoke to him the next day and don't know how it happened. Oh, it's just sat on his pity pot, licking his wounds. Right, well, number one, you either lied to yourself because you told me that you'd thrown the drink out. Number two, you lied to me because I can't help you if you're not honest with me. Or you decided to have a drink, you got up, you put your coat on, you walked to the shop, you picked it up, you paid for it, you carried it home, opened it and sat and drank it. So don't tell me you don't know how it happened. And you could just hear in his voice that, oh, just, yeah. No, yeah, but, again, this goes back to blaming everything. Yeah, but if this hadn't had happened, and yeah, but I'd had a bad day at work and somebody cut me up while I was driving home. There's always something. So this is about helping people in their everyday life, you know. I talk about brain muscle. The easiest way to talk about brain muscle is Someone decides to go to the gym, so they're doing everything to go to the gym. You know, they're, they're eating right, they're sleeping right, they've got the routine. They get to where they want to be, and they go, oh, I've accomplished this. They stop going, and they slide backwards. And that tends to be what happens in, you know, general addiction services and everything. People get to this point, and then it's like, oh. So this is about using the tools. You know, if someone was going to the gym and they maintained it, you know, if they kind of did it consistently, they'd carry on with the same results, wouldn't they? You know, same with the diet. If people go on a diet and then get to where they want, but then moderate that and change that so it's maintenance. There's no expiry date on this stuff. You know, I still have to use my tools, but in a different way. My challenges have changed over the years, but I still use the same tools. That's where people kind of get caught up in complacency. Oh, I've done six months. And then wonder why they're back at square one again. Champion the wins. You know, if somebody has that, they don't open that second bottle of wine, it's a win. If somebody usually starts drinking at six o'clock in the evening, but they wait until eight o'clock, it's a win. This is about helping people to reduce control and self-manage. Check my notes. Cool. Slips and falls. Don't make a slip into a fall. So if someone does get drunk one night, it's a slip. If they carry on that for days, possibly weeks, it's a fall. Don't kind of get them into a mindset of, oh, I've failed and it's, oh, it's all going wrong. Because when they do have a slip, it's helpful because we can home in on that, right, what specifically was going on there for you to do that? It helps me to, you know, compassionately challenge them. Well, what did you do to help yourself? I didn't do that. Well, what do you expect? You know, you can use, I don't like the words relapse or lapse. It's, you know, if you've drank, you've drank. 
If you've drank more than what you wanted, that's a slip. But it's their responsibility, it's not yours. Even I struggled with this in the early days of, what have I missed? Oh, they've drank. No. If they're going to do it, they're going to do it. You're not there pouring it down the neck or you're not there buying it for them. If they're going to do it, they're going to do it. But you need to call them out on that as well. Well, it, it, I don't know how it happened. Yeah, you do. Yeah. It just miraculously appeared. With ice and lemon in it. <laughs> oh, I, I bought two bottles and I didn't mean to. I only wanted one. Yeah, bullshit. People laugh at me about this. Ethical dealers and shops, right? To a dealer, it's a business. Yeah, it's not a hobby. It's a business. So they're into sales. So on a Friday evening, they'll send out a text banging gear in, get your orders in. Yeah, it's a business for them. Now what they also do is, to avoid the police, they regularly change the numbers. They keep the contacts, but they change the numbers. So, there's no escaping it. You know, you can block, the, you know, you probably had to just block the number, but they're still gonna get their messages. It's about dealing with it rather than avoiding it. If they block that number, it's still in the phone, you can unblock it. And if there's a will, there's a way. You know, you will find that I had different dealers. I had my first dealer, if I couldn't get him, I had a couple more to get hold of, okay? So about saying to them, just, do you know what, mate? Just do me a favor, I can't do this anymore. Just don't sell to me anymore. And just take, me, take my number out of your phone, yeah? It can take a couple of tries, you'll just reply, just delete my number, please, mate. And eventually they kind of do. That's where the ethical dealer comes in. You know, the ones that, uh, do you know what, I'm not going to be part of this. Your drinkers, though. So we're creatures of habit. So we'll have different shops that they use on different days to fly under the radar so people don't clock how much they're drinking. You know, if you have got that close shop that you use, just again, do you know what, just don't tell me any drink. They'll know you've got a problem before you do. Yeah? What else was I going to say on there? So this whole thing of changing, changing number. Why should a client change the number that they've probably had for decades? Because that's going to cause more problems than it solves. You know, maybe that person they can reach out to, or you just get that random phone call for someone that, you know, that if they haven't got your number anymore, you can't get that, can you? If it means you drive home a longer way, it takes 10 minutes longer to get home, do it. You've, you know, again, you've got that choice. Putting yourself in front of that shop and then wondering why you drink, there's no one to blame, is there? So one of the main things that I use is <coughs> stop, look and listen, okay? So when you first get that thought, that idea, just stop, take a breath. Look around, where's it come from? We don't just get thoughts from, from anywhere. Is it you've heard a song? Is it you've driven past somewhere? Has something been on the TV? We don't usually question it, we just react. But you can't deal with something if you don't know what you're dealing with. You know, we can all do all these distraction stuff, but you're not going to get to the root cause of where that's coming from. The listen, you know, is it, go on, hit that fuck it button. You've had a bad day, justify it by that. Maybe it's that complacency, you know, oh, I've done two weeks, I can have a line, I can have this. You scale it, one to ten. Number three, you know, you can take action, it's comfortable, you can kind of, you've still got an element of control. Leave it until like it's eight or nine, you're in the trenches. And that's going to be a lot harder to get yourself out of. Again, accountability and responsibility. If you're not recognising your thoughts and your cravings until it's an eight, no one to blame. Yourself. Distract yourself. But I'll come back to that in a moment. So the early days, you know. Like I said, I'm very fluid. I don't have a process. I just go with how it happens. But are they doing the work? Are they coming into sessions, engaging? 
are they taken on board? Are they actually opening up to me about things and are they being open to the idea of possibilities? You've thought it's this situation, maybe it could be that. I have this kind of line that I say to them, you know, you could go to Harley Street and pay thousands and thousands and thousands, but it's not 100% answer. It's all theory. Are they starting to take accountability? You know, are they having the bumps in the road, but are they doing something about it? Are they moving away from that yeah buts? Are they starting to take, you know, they're not blaming people. What works for them and what doesn't? You know, none of us like to be told what to do, do we? So, what works for you? What tools and techniques have you used in the past that's helped? And actually, what hasn't? And that's where I have this thing about people with protocols and there's this CBT approach. They get too fixated on the steps rather than making it their own. Support circle. Then people are around us, but they don't know what to do. They're scared of triggering us. They're scared of causing an argument. So just tell them, do you know what? If I have a craving and an urge and I just, you know, I need to distract myself, you know, I'm going to ask you, can we go for a walk? Yeah. Can we sit and watch TV? It's out of character for these people. So, you know, that third party is giving it to you. What, what are they up to? What have they done? What are they trying to, you know? Someone comes home with a bouquet of flowers, it's like, mm, right, okay. So as you work through this and you get people to you know, see the reduction, you're getting them to take accountability and all of that stuff. It builds the confidence and do you know what actually? It's a bit of a different way of doing it to what I've done before, but there might be something in this. So I'm just... They get confidence in um, the process. It's different to how they've done it before, it's different to how Dr. Google kind of said to do. So bit by bit they just get this, do you know what, there actually might be something in this. You know, I'm seeing these little changes and actually it's not as hard and torturous as I thought it would be. <laughs> Friends and family. They're part of the problem, but they're also part of the solution too. You know, having, you know, the constant conversations at home about have you been drinking, all the, it just focuses and it's just that all encompassing conversation. <clears throat> Clearly what the friends and family have been doing haven't been helping either because you're still in this situation. Yeah? This is about the community. As much as you can do so much with a client in the chair, you've got to carry that through to home. So they need to change their approach too. But what some people tend to do is back away, just disappear. They don't say, do you know what, I can't do this anymore. You're causing problems in my relationship. They just disappear. So then the client is, oh, well if they don't care, I don't care. Back onto that roundabout. Yeah. Initially, it's the third party person, you know, the wife, the mother, the girlfriend that gets in touch with me. So I'll kind of explain the process to them. They have more faith if it comes from me. You know, actually, th yeah, this is how it's going to be. I bring them into the process. I will say to them, the third party, do you know what, I'm at the end of the phone for you as well. Obviously bearing in mind confidentiality and that kind of thing as well. But if my voodoo sparks and picture and sound with a client in, you know, balancing. I'll ring the third party. Hi, how are you doing? Just sort of check in, see what's going on. Yeah, it's been a bit of a bad week. They've drank three times this week. I'm like, oh, right, okay then, right. So when I'm with a client next, I will use that and say, look, this, so the things that originally triggered my voodoo, I will say to them, do you know what? You kind of tripped yourself up a couple of times there. You know, you, you, your story didn't follow through. So again, it's accountability, it's cha challenging them. And they're like, oh yeah, I can't get it. Because we think we can bluff everyone. You know, we can have a drink and no one notices. She can't smell like Yeah. So that's my voodoo. But it's about being open and honest with each other. Like I said, getting them on board. Come on, let's go for a walk. 
Yeah? I'm going to go and clean the garage or something. It's out of character. But what that actually shows the third party is they're trying. You know, you're not even trying. How many times have you probably heard that? You're not even trying to sort this out. Whereas if this kind of, do you know what? I've had a really shit day and I just want to, you know, that thought of going and getting a bottle of wine is there. Let's go and do something. It shows how that they're trying and actually how often they're struggling. So again, it's getting them on board. The great debate about money restriction. Well, just cut them off. Just give them an allowance. Give them pocket money. You're treating them like children. Yeah? You wouldn't want to be like that. How would you feel if someone said, you know, there you go, there's $10 today for your lunch. Problems, back onto the roundabout. If I couldn't get it, so if I didn't have money and I couldn't get a hold of the dealer, I was fine. There was no temptation there. So it's not about, you know, letting them keep the full salary. It might be just, do you know what? There's enough there to cause you temptation. You know, $20 there, enough to get a couple of bottles of wine with. But you're not going to mess up the family finances for the month. Because, again, it goes to that, we can't deal with something if we don't know what they're dealing with. So what's triggering that temptation? Yeah? That one. How am I doing for time? I don't know if anyone's come across this before. Cartman Triangle, the drama triangle. So there's three positions, prosecutor, rescuer and victim. Okay? This is just a really basic kind of way of, I'm going to kind of tell it to you. It can get quite complex. As you, you know, like the parent, child, adult? It can kind of get quite deep at times. So we all play a position in any interaction, but that position can change within each interaction. So Fred comes home. Lucy asks, oh, where have you been? But what Fred hears is, where have you been? Yeah? Fred, oh my God, I can't even go out. Victim. Lucy, I was just asking where you've been. Rescuer. Fred, are you checking up on me? Prosecutor. Lucy, no, I just wanted to know how your day was. Rescuer. Fred, you don't trust me. Storms out, blaming Lucy. She's the prosecutor. Lucy's upset. Fred comes back. I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. He's now the rescuer. Lucy, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry too. She becomes the rescuer. If you change the position, you change their interaction. So just think about that. If Fred had actually heard the genuine question that Lucy had asked, that whole confrontation wouldn't have been there. Then they don't blame Lucy. Then they don't go out and drink. It's them little steps to change it. You all making a bit of sense? Yes. Marvellous. Won't be fair to not talk about other services out there. You know, it's not just one thing. It's add things to it. So I, how long? 18. Oh. So my recovery, I spent three days, three years in daycare. So daycare at home is, um, it's a centre where you can go and do, um, you do groups. There's like a social thing there. It gave you purpose, gave you something to do rather than just sat in your at home twiggling your thumbs. A big part of it as well was Narcotics Anonymous. I took what I needed and I still use it today. You see long timers that have long term, you know, sobriety. I nearly said that C word then, didn't I? Um, but they're still going to five meetings a week. They're not living. You've heard, you've heard about the dry drunk? Yes. Yeah? It's like they put down one addiction and pick up another one. They're not living life. Or not the life they deserve to. So when I trained, I could start to see the conflict. Yes, the anonymouses, this kind of stuff, was working on the conscious level, but not the subconscious level. But also... A, uh, the language patterns were a big part of it as well. Hi, I'm Thomas, I'm an, I'm an addict. Yeah? You're still talking about yourself in the now. 
You're adding more layers of that belief of I'm an addict. So I reframed it in my head and I was, hi, I'm Thomas, I'm an addict. But I was talking about, I was thinking about myself of where I've come from. Not where I am now and not where I'm going. They talk about step four as being defects of character um, and moral inventory. You know, we're all, we've all been dishonest. We're all self-centered. We can all manipulate and coerce situations. So we could all kind of say we've all got defects, haven't we? Yes. Yeah? But they make out we're different with this special cohort of people that's got their own set of problems. No, we haven't. We've got the same as everybody else. We just use drinking drugs to deal with it or gambling or whatever it is. So I offer clients to go to the first meeting with them um, and usually get, yeah, no, I've been there and it's God and it's prayers and um, higher power stuff. It's a spiritual program. It's not a religious one. But it's about kind of getting through that initial <gasps> and seeing it. I just don't like groups. <laughs> yeah, I just don't like groups. Well, how's not doing groups been working for you? Yeah? Oh, what if I go there and I know people there? Well, they're there for the same reasons as you are. Yeah? Does that, you know, what's, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What's said in the rooms stays in the rooms. I've, walk, you know, I've, I've come across people walking through the supermarket and you just walk past them. You know, there's that whole kind of unspoken confidentiality and boundaries. Um, I'm not like those people. But, so I point out, but can you see there's a chair there waiting for you? If you don't sort this out, you're going to be that person broken in that chair. SMART is very much based on CBT kind of approach. Um, detox and rehab, better known as cash cows. You know, we know the depth of how things can impact people's life. How much are you actually going to get done in four weeks? You're not going to do a lot, are you? Even just with counselling and group work. But they come out thinking, I'm all fixed, I'm all sorted. And then a few months later, I wonder why they're back where they are. Because they haven't built the brain muscle. They haven't made it consistent. Um, just quickly, has anyone come across um, recovery coaching over here? The one I'm kind of aware of is Connecticut Community for Addiction Recovery. No? So it's a network of volunteers. They are placed in places like um, emergency rooms and shelters. They're there as that kind of point of contact. They can take the weight off the staff. They just want to come in and talk. They just want to help. And these people can signpost and advocate for them. It's worth looking into that. It's, an, it's a nice way forward. The how-to. Don't reinvent the wheel. You know, they've got everything that they need. It's about not being a hermit. Getting out and living life. But have a plan. You know... If you're going to go somewhere, it's a party, go early, leave late. Oh, sorry, go early, leave early. Before the... <laughs> go early, leave early. Um, you, know, before the, you know, before people start getting too drunk or, you know, the, the bag starts getting shuffled around. You know it's going to happen. Again, it's that accountability and responsibility. You know it's going to happen. So if you stay after that time and you have a slip or a fall, don't come crying to me. Pressure points. We all sit on the toilet, don't we? We all brush our teeth. We all drive to work or we're in the you know, we have our me time. Think about your day, your pressure points. You know, what's going to be a struggle today? What's going to be hard? You know, if we don't think about it and we don't put plans in place, we're not really being aware, are we? The power points. So the pressure points, how's my day going to be? What's going to be challenging? PowerPoints, what can I do? What tools and techniques? What thinking? What can I do? Oh, actually, I'm supposed to meet Fred at four o'clock. I'll see if he's free at two o'clock. I had this client, Taekwondo man, and he was a semi-professional Taekwondo fighter. So when I pointed out he's got discipline, he's got commitment, he's got control, he's doing it already. He didn't realise. You know, to 
eat, train, do all that discipline, to go to training, to matches when he didn't want to. Commitment, control. He knew when to move, he knew when to hit, he knew when to effect, um, defend. He had all this stuff, he didn't just see it. So he turned alcohol into an opponent. Yeah. Just quickly. So I've talked about distractions, using their daily life, okay? Stop, look and listen, scale it. Oh, oh, it's number three, what shall I do? Uh, what's gonna work? Uh, uh. They get caught up in the, you know, the if. So if you make two post-its, two pieces of paper, stick it on the fridge, stick it next to the, the bathroom mirror, put it on your phone. All they have to do is think about is getting to them, them post-its. Whatever your eyes drop on first, do it, follow your gut. Because by the time they've, what shall I do, what shall I do, that three's gone up to a five. Mm. So I've got on there, sit with it. It's okay to sit with it, but choose the times to sit with it. Again, it's building that brain muscle. As much as you're building brain muscle using tools and techniques, you've got to build brain muscle of dealing with them feelings too. So it's okay to sit with it. Okay, nearly done. So there's this perception of addiction being this big, scary thing, and I'm not trained in it. You already have the tools and the techniques that you, you need. I don't use anything different. Parts, inner child, some modality work, NLP techniques, I use it. But it's about hopefully this kind of information and insight that can help you just approach it a bit differently. You know, I support therapists at home with their clients. It's really easy for me to take referrals, dead easy. But that's not getting people comfortable working with addiction. The more people that are comfortable, the more people we can help. Cool, thank you. Not too bad on time. I've got some cards here. Like I said, uh, you know, I'm on Facebook, I'm on all that usual stuff. Get in touch if you just want to run questions past me or you just, I've got this client and the, the, this. Anyway, questions. Yes, Kelly. So first of all, I appreciate the fact that so much of what you uh, presented goes across the board. It transcends all kinds of different issues. So I appreciate that. Um, speak directly to the person who calls you and wants, want, like, wants to quit and the, the medical issue like the detox part of right. that, because we can't, how do you, how do you manage that? Um, I've had a few physically dependent clients. Yes. And how do you, so how do you determine that and what do you do? So again, this is kind of a, a, a gray area. There's physical dependency and there's a, there's a habitual dependency. You know, if someone is drinking and if they don't have that drink, they've got the sweats, the withdrawals, the nausea, all of that then you know, I'd, I'd kind of take it case by case. If they're at that stage, they know how to stop that. They've done it before. Yes, of course, I say, look, do you know what? Go and see your doctor. But a lot of my clients are professional people. You know, part of their job could be that they need a yearly medical. So they don't want to go to the doctor and have it on the medical, medical records. That's why they come to a private therapist. You know, we've got the NHS at home, which is a blessing and a curse at the same time. People will sit on waiting lists for months, years, before doing anything. So by the time they get to me, they're desperate. You know, they're, they're, they've done everything they can. Does that answer? No, I need to know, like, because we can't, I, so that's one of the things that I've, that I've struggled with when people call because it's hard to know, it's like, I'm not a medical person, so if you're asking me... If that's out of your comfort zone, don't go near it. Okay, so, but then, would it, is the option then, you know, be, be off of it for two weeks or whatever? No. Or a week and then come and see no, you? just... You know, I have worked with people before that are physically dependent, but like I said, the, you know, it's me having that conversation saying, you know, have you, have you, come, off, have you come off it before? You know how to reduce down, yeah? 
come back and see me then, or we might work together. That's me putting myself in a position I know, but it's only times that I'm comfortable with. But if you're not comfortable with it, and depending on what the law and regulations are over here, send them to a doctor, tell them, come back. So your main question is just, you know, you know how to reduce yeah. or stop. Yeah. Take, okay. Yeah. Okay. If they don't, doctor, I don't get involved. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To each client on their own. I will ask them, you know, have you stopped before? How did you stop? Right. Okay. Three minutes. Anything else? Oh, sorry. Go on. Sometimes, oh, sorry. I start working with people with addiction, and something doesn't work for them. They kind of fail, and they feel so ashamed, they don't want to come back. How do we deal with that? So the question was, people that have, you know, engaged, um, but they feel like they've failed, how do we approach it? Ask them, what, what, you know, why didn't it work? We have this, all this wonderful information in our head. And again, it's Taekwondo, man. What's going to help you? Maybe someone didn't like parts therapy. Maybe they're, they're more into the NLP, some modality. Change your tact. Yeah, it's not about you not doing your work. It's about it not working for them. Well done. That's what I mean. It. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not, like, no. I don't know how to drink less. I just know how to help you not drink. So is there a, like, how do you help people that just want to control? I'm like, shit, if, I, if, if it could be controlled, I'd do that too. So the question is, um, how do people kind of control it? And again, this comes to this, back to what do you want? Yeah. There is that line. So if people cross that line, they can't come back. They have to, so... This is where the expiry date, you've always got to work at it. You know, if you're going to go out and you know that them lot of party animals, don't go out with them. Go out with other people that are safe people. It is possible. There's a client in particular, she drinks at home. Yeah. She started with, I want to lose weight. And then I said, okay, with the weight loss, you're hiking, you're eating clean, you're doing all these, how much alcohol do you drink? Oh, you know, one to three glasses a night. Okay, is this sometimes a bottle? Sure. So when she comes in, it's, okay, I have to have three glasses of white and then two glasses of red or I can't sleep. So I'm like, is it sleep, <laughs> Twaddle. is it alcohol, is it weight loss, is it flat out denial, is it anxiety? Like, yes. I have to go with weight loss because that's what she came in with. So to answer your question there, so if someone comes to us up for weight loss, we don't stop the meeting, do we? Right. You know, people don't then starve themselves on a diet. Well, depending on what diet you're on. Um, <laughs> So it's about managing people and helping them to self-manage and self-control. Two minutes, thank you. Uh, yes, heroin. Yeah? Would that be outside of the scope of practice? Someone actually asked me this. Um, and again, you know, even though I say I'm not judgmental, we all are, aren't we? Yeah. yeah? You know, let's just say it as it is. Someone that's, you know, injecting heroin, they're down on that far scale. Yeah? I've had inquiries from people, more through family members, but yeah, I didn't feel comfortable with it, yeah? There is that they weren't engaging, they were just kind of trying to tick boxes and all that kind of stuff, it was that next thing of, oh well that didn't work, I'll go to rehab, or self you know, it's that self-fulfilling process, I'm never going to get sort this out, you know, I'm just going to be an addict for the rest of my life, so it's permission to just to crack on. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah? So heroin, no, I don't really work with it. It's, that's a kind of different beast on its own. But I do work with prescription drugs. So opioid prescription drugs. Come on. Yes, Greg? I have someone who calls, and I've worked with a little bit, they'll call and not leave a message. And they'll call and not leave a message. And call, you know. And, and, and it's their way of reaching out. At a certain point, is, you, know, you have to leave a message. I mean, yeah. It's my, yeah. You know, kind of thing. Does that make So I think the question was, um, you know, people ring up, they kind of do that little baby steps. I have slow burners. So from that first contact, it's taken sometimes months for that client to get in the chair. 
oh, I've made a phone call. Oh, I've done something about it. I'll go off. Two weeks later, oh, uh, yeah, I might leave a message this time. Oh, I've done something about it. Off to go again. Yeah? It can take a bit of time for people to engage. There's the shame and the guilt in there. Yeah, fear. What, what, can I do this? So, thank you very much. I hope it's been helpful.